Margaret Lee that's always sitting over here and so faithful when she does our Women in Touch. She actually, um, to my knowledge, is still in the hospital. I didn't get to go by and, and check on her today, but um, she, she has problems with breathing sometimes and with asthma. She went to work yesterday morning. As far as I know, she went to work. I got a phone call from one of her coworkers that they were taking her to the hospital. She wasn't able to breathe. Um, she was actually very, very critical. By the time we got there, she was alert. She was alert. God's so good. She said, I'm going to beat this one more time, she said. God is good. But we were praying that God would just breathe his breath into her lungs and give her strength in her lungs. And so you continue to remember Miss Margaret. She's so precious. Also, the Wyatt family at Lakin, who is um, actually now in the country, back in our country. She is going to be in Kentucky. When we go down there tomorrow night, Pastor Todd and I are supposed to see her, maybe to do dinner with her. But she'll be in Kentucky tomorrow night. She'll be going back to Oklahoma. And then from that point, she'll be coming home next week. She'll fly into Charlotte. Her parents will pick her up. But remember her and her a brother, their uncle, was actually killed tragically in a car accident yesterday morning. And so you just remember that family, the Wyatt family. I know they would appreciate your prayers. And Miss Lakin's not going to be able to be there. She's pretty close to her uncle, I believe, but she's not going to be able to, to be at those services. So you just pray for her. God will give her a, a special um, blanket of comfort over her and, and peace. And also remember the Reeves family um, that lost their sweet daughter this week to an, a car accident. And she's got two little girls and she lost her baby that was due in a couple of weeks. And you know, sometimes we don't know why, why bad things happen to good people. I don't have an answer for that. Except it's life. But God is still God. And God is always good. And so through this darkness, it's hard to see for people right now. But God will bring beauty from ashes. I believe that. And so you pray for that family and remember them. I know they would appreciate it. I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes and I'm going to read pretty lengthy. Um, but I think that it, it's worth it. And uh, I'm going to read from the book of Ruth tonight. I'm, I'm going to actually start on the second chapter. But before I start on the second chapter, I'm kind of going, to, going to kind of give you a little background of, of what... Um, uh, the first chapter is all about and uh, we're, we're actually going to stay in chapter 2 even though I encourage you to take this message tonight and go home and get out your Bibles and pick out pick up, um, open up to the book of Ruth and actually read the rest of the book of Ruth. It's an amazing book. It's a, it's a book of hope. It's a book of life. It's, it's, a, it's a romance novel, ladies, if you like that kind of thing and it's a clean one and so um, it would be really it's, it's just a great great book in the Bible. So I encourage you to take it tonight and, and read it um, as the few days go, the next few days go along and, and just finish out the chapter and see what actually happens to the end. But um, in, in the first chapter of the book of Ruth, there's a lady and her name is Naomi. And she was married to a man and his name was Elimelech. And they were from Bethlehem of Judah. They had two sons and, and uh, there was a famine that was in the land and they decided to take their family and move to the country of Moab where they could eat to keep them from starving to death. And so after they got there, time went by and Naomi's husband Elimelech, he passed away. And so after um, the sons eventually married two women that were Moabite women, which they were foreigners, and, um, and, and the reason that that's important is because, um, you know, in the Bible it tells us not to be unequally yoked and it's not talking about skin color. God doesn't see that. It's actually talking about what God that you serve. And in the, in the land of Moab, the Moabites actually served foreign gods. They didn't serve the one true God that, that is our healer and deliverer and the, the one and only. They didn't serve him. But, but um, Naomi and her family served the one true God. So her sons married um, these two foreign ladies and they were married about 10 years um, passed and their sons, uh, her sons passed away. So there was Naomi without a husband, without her two sons, and she had these two daughter-in-laws. And they must have really loved her very much. Um, the famine had actually ended, they found out, and Naomi decided she would go back to her, her land, she would go back to Judah, and as she started back to Judah, she encouraged her daughters-in-law to go back home 
to, to Moab and to stay with their family, go, you know, that she had nothing for them. She said, even if I go away and you follow me and I end up meeting a man and getting married, you're not going to stay around long enough for those kids to grow up so you can marry them. So not like that's even going to happen, but she said, you have no reason to go with me. So if you'll just go back home where your family is. And so one of the, one of the daughters, her name was Orpah, and she decided that she would go back. But this lady, this daughter-in-law named Ruth, must have really connected with Naomi and I don't think that she connected I believe she connected with Naomi but I believe that she really in her heart connected with the God that Naomi served and so there's a really sweet scripture and I want to read that to you that is out of the first chapter and it's 17 and 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 Ruth says to Naomi she says where you die I will die and there I will be buried may the Lord deal with me actually I wanted to do 16 I'm sorry but she says where you go I will go that's what she says. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And then she says, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And that's what Ruth said to Naomi. And I think that's a really precious scripture. It's a very well-known scripture. And I think it's really sweet because it shows how much that Ruth really loved her. And she says, you know, your God will be my God. And so at that point, Ruth decided, you know what, I don't want to serve these foreign gods. There's something about my mother-in-law, Naomi, that I've seen a strength in her after losing her, this is not in the Word, after losing her husband and after losing her sons, there's still a strength in her and there's something about this God that she serves that I want to connect myself to and I don't want to go back to serving foreign gods that can't do anything for me. And actually, uh, Naomi, at this particular point, she was actually very distraught. She had gotten to a place in her life where she really felt like that God had left her. That he really, um, you know, God, you've taken my husband, you've taken my sons, I'm out in this foreign land, and, and I've got these two girls, I don't know what to do with them, I can't take care of them, you know, I, I, I don't have anybody to even take care of myself. Lord, I feel like that you've even left me. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a place in your life where you know God is real and you know that, that you, you believe in Him, but you're in a place to where it seems like every time you pray, nothing happens. When you ask Him for things, nothing happens. When, you, when mountains are in your way, they, they, you, you can pray and they don't move like the Word says if you have faith and believe as a mustard seed that you can ask this mountain to move and it will move. And you're, you're standing in, in front of that mountain and, and you're not feeling it move. And you've got a mountain on each side and the water's in front of you you got Pharaoh and his army behind you. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever been there where you've actually said, God, I wonder if you've even left me? Because all these other people, they seem to pray and things work and things happen, Lord, and, and you bless them and, and, and you know, their marriage was messed up and now it's great and they, they were financially distraught and, and, and broke and now they're blessed and they're buying new homes and they're buying new cars and God, I don't even know how that I'm going to pay my light bill. Where are you, Lord? Have you ever felt that way? I think that Naomi was there when she went back. And so at this particular point, we're going to start reading in chapter 2. And like I said, it's pretty lengthy, but I want you to just listen to the story. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. And Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and she entered a field and she began to glean behind the harvesters. And as it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. And just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and he greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. They answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does this young woman belong to? And the overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. And she came into the field and has remained here from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. 
And at this, she bowed down with her face to the ground, and she asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? And Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother and your homeland, and you came to live with a people that you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. She was lower than his servant. Think about that. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here and have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. And when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain, and she ate all she wanted, and she had some left over. And as she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening and then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephath, which is about 30 pounds, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered and Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. And her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, she added. That man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. And then Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, Stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all of my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. And the title of my message tonight is simply this, There's Favor in the Field. Heavenly Father, we just come to you, Lord, and we have... We have um, read your word, God, that we know is anointed. Lord, you anointed it many, many, many thousand years ago. But God, I ask that you anoint the ears to hear the word and accept the word and to receive the word, God. But I ask you to anoint me to deliver the word to the people the way you gave it to me. God, may we take this word out of here and be doers of the word and not just hearers only. We thank you for all that you've done and we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. So here we see that Boaz is Naomi's kinsman redeemer. And what a kinsman redeemer is, is it was, it was a close relative. So when someone had passed away, they actually were the person that, that jumped in and rescued that person when they were in distress. Meaning he was her husband's uh, relative, very close relative so it was kind of his obligation to turn around and to um, take over and help Naomi to survive because women didn't fend for themselves the men took care of the women and so um, otherwise she wouldn't have made it but there were if you go in and you read there was another kinsman redeemer as well but that that's a whole different story within within this story and you can read on and see how it goes but anyway Ruth found favor in the eyes of Boaz I think she was a very pretty lady. I think that she was very striking that when he looked out in the field, he knew this is not one of those people that I'm used to seeing out here. And she caught his eye. And I don't think that she caught his eye really just because necessarily of her outward appearance, but I believe it was a God thing that she caught his eye because God was connecting him to her for a reason. It was called favor. And so she found favor in the field of Boaz. And so what did this get her? Ruth 2 and 9 says this. I think we have it in here separate. It says, watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. What this actually got her was it got her protection. Being in the favor of God can get you protection supernatural protection you know having God's favor is when God does things supernaturally very quickly if you're in God's favor and you have favor with God he can do things supernaturally quick that would take you a long time to do 
So you have to understand that she was this strange woman in this field, and he's telling these other men, you don't mess with her, Boaz said. But Boaz's word was good for them. That's all they needed to hear. He said, you make sure you don't lay a hand on her and don't you touch her. So God's favor through Boaz to Ruth gave her protection. Ruth 2 and 12, I love this. It says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. I love that picture in my mind. That I can actually go sit under the wings of my Savior and know that when the winds blow, I'm protected. I, I, you know, have you ever seen a, 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 like a bird? That's what she does with her young. She puts them under her wings and she protects them. There's a story that I don't know is true. We heard it to be true of, of, of maybe out west where there was a, a really big um, fire and... Um, after the fire had left and everything was burned, some of the firefighters had walked out, and, and this could very well be true, and there was a, a, a bird that was actually charred and, and completely dead. And it was, it was sitting there, and as they kicked the bird, underneath it was babies that were still alive. She had sacrificed herself and protected her babies. And I think about that with the Lord in a whole lot of ways. I, I actually was thinking about it a little bit today when I, I was thinking about Zach. And he's been on our mind a lot for the last week and a half. Because about three, or three years ago, he, he started coming to Life Changers. And, and it, there was just something about him that Pastor Todd and I, we just really thought a lot of him. He seemed like a very kind young man. That's probably the way that I can explain it. He joined our church. He had just graduated from high school. And so he's kind of, um, you know, on Facebook, you kind of see, and they like your stuff and your posts that you put in. So there would be times that we would post things, you know, scriptures or whatever, devotions, and he would like it, and we would think, he's still connected, Lord. But I have a feeling that that Sunday night when things went the way that they did, I really believe that God had him tucked under his wings. Now, his physical body was beaten up, but they couldn't kill him because God had a plan. So when you have favor with God, you have special protection. I want that favor. We pray all the time, and you'll hear us say as pastors that we pray that God's favor would chase you down. What does that mean? I want him to chase me down. I want him to chase me down with favor before I can even think about it. He's already got it taken care of. Before I even need protecting, he's already taken care of it. Before I need provision, he's already taken care of it. Before I need peace, he's already taken care of it. So Ruth 2 and 13 says this. Do I have that up there, 2 and 13? If I don't, it's okay. Because one of the things that it says, yeah, there it is. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. One of the things, another thing that God's favor will give you is peace. Peace is important. If you've never had peace, you don't understand it. Or if you've always had peace, you don't understand it. But I know that everybody in here at one time or another has been restless and not had peace. And when you don't have peace and you get it, it's amazing. Because it's almost like it's a warm oil that just pours over you. That even though everything around you is going to pieces, you have comfort. You have peace. You're not anxious. Be anxious for nothing, the Bible says. So it gave her peace because it said, you have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant. Because to be honest with you, she put her life in jeopardy by walking into this field that was somebody else's, that she didn't have permission to be in. And what she would do was when you glean, when the harvesters would go in and they would get the, the grain and the wheat, things that, that what would fall and be left over is what she would come up and clean up. So that's what gleaning is. And so she didn't have permission. She wasn't even a servant. She even said, I'm not even, you know, on the level of your servants. So God's favor gave her peace. 
Ruth 2 and 14 says, At mealtime Boaz said to her, Come over, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. And when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and she had some left over. God's favor will give us provision. Because he also said to the fellas, just go ahead and leave some of that for her, would you? Leave some of those sheaves. Drop some of that. Leave it for her. Let her come right behind you. Make sure she has some. So when she, she had enough left over to take back to, to Naomi, God's favor gives us provision. One of the things that God told us about this move that was coming when we left 24th Street and we didn't know what street we were going to. We thought we were going to the cove. And one of the things God says is, my favor is on you. And before you even ask, I will have taken care of what you need. And we find that almost weekly. That somebody comes to us and they ask us if we need something. And it's something that we hadn't even maybe thought about, but we needed. Something that we had thought about in our mind, but hadn't even asked Him for it. And somebody comes and offers it. God's favor gives us provision. And I, and I had to think about it because this is all just Tammyology. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not, it's kind of something you have to pull out of that. And I had to think, God, what caused Ruth to have such favor? And I believe it came from her obedience. I believe that she was obedient to Naomi. I believe that she trusted Naomi. I believe that she sacrificed for Naomi. I believe she was obedient to God, even though she didn't really know exactly who he was. I believe she trusted in a God that she still wasn't real sure about. I believe that she sacrificed for a God because she left her home and she said, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. And so as I got to thinking about it, it ultimately it was Ruth's love for Naomi that caused her to want to follow her, to obey her, to trust her, and to sacrifice for her. So then I got to thinking about us as Christians. And we talk a lot about love. You know, in our world today, it's all about love. Um, and nobody wants to think that God is a God of wrath. They always want to think that He's a God of, of love. But I, I think He's a God of both. Because His Word says it. I don't think He takes pleasure in, in pouring out His wrath because He says that. But I do know that there's two sides to Him. He's balanced. That's what He is. And so I got to thinking, Lord... You know, in 2018, we can all have the same favor that Ruth had. How do we have it? Well, I think we pray for it. I think we ask for it. I think we believe for it. I think every day when you get up, you need to say, God, I pray that your favor will chase me down today. I'm asking for favor with you, and I'm asking for favor with man. See, God, she had favor in God's eyes, but God also gave her favor with Boaz. God can give you favor with man that can get you promotions when you don't deserve them, can get you, um, can get you um, things that you, you know, vehicles that you really didn't even ask him for. I know it's not all about material things, but everything I get, God gets the credit, no matter what it is. If it's a job, he gets the credit. If it's a car, he gets the credit. If it's a house, he gets the credit. If, if it's a, a light bill, he gets the credit. He gets the credit for all of it. But that's what we have to do is we have to pray for it, ask for it, believe for it. And I believe as we do this, then I believe our thought process begins to change. And we begin to think, I'm favored. I am blessed and I'm highly favored. You know how I say that I'm God's favorite. And, and, and some of you may think, boy, that's pretty cocky. No, it's not, because you should think the same thing. You should think that you're God's favorite. We found out in the praise team room, somebody let me know that actually Zach was God's favorite. God loves you. You are his favorite. He took time to make you. He took time to put all of your stuff together. He took time to, to build something in you that a lot of people never get out. He took time to put something in you that a lot of people never nurture. They never know what their purpose and their plan is. 
but you are God's favorite. You should pray for his favor. We had a young man that, that grew up in the church that we went to years ago, and he, you know, he didn't always live for the Lord. He lived a little loose. But if you would ask him how he was, he would say, my mama says, I'm blessed and I'm highly favored. I'm blessed and I'm highly favored. And I was talking to a mama yesterday that's having a little trouble with her adult son. And, he, and, and he's, he's kind of rebellious and he's kind of doing his own thing and he's kind of getting in some trouble. And she said, you know, I had to get peace about that. I had to just give him to Jesus because I was about to lose my mind. And God put on my heart to tell her, you begin to speak over him. You know what, son? You are blessed and highly favored. When he smarts off to you instead of smacking him in the mouth like you really want to do and like really, you know, we should do, then you need to look at him and you need to say, Son, you are blessed and highly favored. I thank you that God has a plan for your life. I thank you that these drugs aren't going to have you. I thank you that Jesus, God, God created you for a purpose and a plan. Jesus died for you. And I believe if we begin to speak those things over people, over ourselves, that God will bless us and he will favor us. God can give you favor with man, as he did Ruth with Boaz. You know, I be we begin to see, you know, more heartily. We begin to believe more with our heart that, God, I'm going to be favored today. When you have to go into an interview or, a, you know, a, a talk with your boss that you're worried about, you begin to pray favor over yourself. You begin to you pray that, that God will bless you as you go, that he will favor you when you get in there. When you, when you go into a place that you're not real sure about, you begin to ask for favor with those people that are there. When you're in a dangerous situation, you need to begin to pray for favor. But instead of those people hating you, they'll begin to like you and they don't even know why. When they have all the reasons to not. But fervently, wholeheartedly, God will position us for favor. We will begin to be at the right place at the right time. We'll begin, begin to get the right job at the right time. We'll begin to be in the right church at the right time. Now, I'm a firm believer that if you get your honey in the right church at the right time, then you'll get the job at the right time, and you'll have the favor that you need from, from God and from man. I think it's just that important. I've, heard, I've, I've said for years, don't curse what God has blessed. And I heard somebody say, not too long ago, within the last couple of weeks, they were just, I don't even remember who it was, it was somebody uh, on, on TV or something, and they're like, you know what, you can't curse what God has blessed. And I completely disagree. Because when a, a couple comes to, before a pastor to get married, and they make a covenant to God, whether they serve Him or whether they don't, um, and God blesses that covenant that they've made, and they turn around and go sleep with somebody that's not their husband or their wife, they've cursed it. That marriage will never be the same. I think when people get jobs that, that, that they've been praying for, and they fervently believe for, and God bless them with, and they turn around and it keeps them out of God's, the fellowship that God has placed them in, they can curse what God has blessed. I didn't get any amens over that, but it is true. I've seen it happen. I told you. I've got to where I quit praying for people to get a job. Lord, if it means them being broke, busted, and disgusted to keep them here every Sunday and Wednesday and on their knees and believing for you, I pray they never get a job. So don't come and ask me to pray for you to get a job if you plan on taking that job that God blesses you with and you curse it and you don't come to God's house. I won't do it. Because your soul, and it's not, your soul is that, is that important, but it's not even that you can't stay saved. It's not about that. It's about your favor and your covering is here if God brought you here. Now, if God didn't bring you here and he's called you to a different fellowship, that's where you need to be. It's not that we don't want you. You are more than welcome to be in here, but if God's called you somewhere else, your favor will be there and your covering will be there. And I'm not talking about seasons. I'm not talking about people growing in the Lord and, and moving you know, to another fellowship. That happens. But when I thought about that bird 
covering his, his little young, and I thought about God covering us with his wings, why would we step out of that? It's crazy. What happens? You don't have protection. You don't have provision. And you don't have peace. Because I know that in eight years of pastoring, and actually in the 30 years of, of being in ministry altogether, I've watched people leave a fellowship that God didn't call them to leave. And to this day, they're not settled. And they don't know why. They're mad at everybody, and they don't know why. Don't step out of your covering. It's like I am really um, weird about my hair. I like my hair. And so, I don't like my hair getting wet. I don't care if it is just a cloud the size of a man's hand outside. I will be carrying an umbrella. Because I don't like my hair getting wet. It makes me aggravated. It puts me in a mood. Why would you be standing in a storm getting completely soaking wet when there's an umbrella right there? that you can step under. Why, why do people do that? Why do people step out of God's anointing? But see, the, it, it's, what happens is it's, it's so subtle. The enemy, the, you know, we, we, we get in a place of favor. And sometimes we get complacent about it. You know, we've been there. So we kind of forget really that we've got favor. And we get distracted. And that's the devil. Because he wants us distracted. Because if we're distracted, then we become dissatisfied. And once we become dissatisfied, then we want to go somewhere. And the next thing you know, we've stepped right out of God's favor, right out from underneath his protection, right out from underneath his provision, right out from underneath his peace, and we're wandering around from place to place trying to find where we belong. See, I pray that I never forget where my favor is and my covering and my protection and my peace. You know, Pastor Todd and I, you know, we don't worry about um, people vote, you know, saying, hey, coming up against us and saying, hey, we don't want you as our pastors anymore. We don't worry about that because God put us here. We ain't going nowhere. It's never happened. I'm just saying we have peace here. We have favor here. We have provision here. He protects us here. We've had people come and say, you know, if somebody offered you a, a job at a bigger church, would you leave and go? And we're like, why would we do that? That's foolish. This is where we're supposed to be. This is our... We are Life Changers Christian Center. This is where our protection is. It's where our favor is. God's had favor on us since we walked in the door. I like being under his covering. I like being under his wing. I like being where he has positioned me with his favor. And the problem is when we begin to get unsettled and dissatisfied, then somebody else's field looks more appealing. There's favor in the field. Be in the right field. If God's placed you in Boaz's field, stay there. I'm not talking about fellowship. I'm just talking about just in general. That's where his favor is. If you want to know where God's favor is going to be, then you pray for it. You ask God to show you. You let him lead you to that place that that favor is at. Whether it's a job, whether it's a church. And for those of you that are single, it may be a relationship. You need his favor in your life. You know, I, I'm glad that my, I have favor with my husband. I would hate to think that I didn't have. I said if I planned on staying married to somebody for the rest of my life, I'm going to like it. I'm going to enjoy myself. So I'm thankful that he likes me back. 
Because he always said, if you ever decide you're going somewhere, just let me know, I'm going to pack my stuff and go with you. <laughs> and I say the same thing. There's favor. It's blessed. There's protection there. He takes care of me. There's provision there. There's peace there. There's safety there. So don't ever let somebody else's field be more appealing to you because you need that protection, the provision, the peace. Don't step out of it. I want to give you a few scriptures on the favor of God, God's favor, because it really does talk about God's favor in the Bible, and I'm just giving you a few. Psalms 5 and 12. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as a shield. So how do we find his favor? We live righteous. That's how you find his favor. You live righteous. Did I say you live perfect? No, I didn't say that. We can't be perfect. But we can try our best to live righteous. Because if we love him, I think we'll want to obey him. I think we'll want to serve him. Psalms 84 and 11. For the Lord God is, is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. There he goes again. Blameless, righteous. God loves that. He loves that. I heard a man um, that, that pr uh, gave a prophecy in 2018, and we've actually listened to it uh, numerous times, and I listened to it again today. It's just kind of been on my heart. I wanted to go back and listen to it. And, and one of the things he said was that, that God's, um, that for those who are sinners and their temptations are what's causing them to fail, there's mercy for that. What does that mean? It means there are people out there that are really, really trying. Maybe they've not got it yet. Maybe it's not, you know, it's not got into their heart yet that they really need that walk with the Lord, but they so want it, and they just haven't gotten there. But they keep falling into these dumb temptations out of weaknesses, but not because they really want to. God has mercy for that. It's the people that constantly do things all the time, knowing that it's wrong, doing it anyway. It's that rebellious heart. God sees your heart. I'm thankful that he sees your heart. That's why that I can't judge you because I don't see your heart. I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know the cries of the, of the, um, the alcoholic who's homeless living under the bridge. I don't know what his cries are. Maybe he doesn't like living that way. Maybe he cries out to God every day, please, Lord, don't let me fall into this again. I don't like living the way that I'm living. God, I hate living like this. Please help me. God sees that heart. Now, there's deliverance for all that. So if that happens to be you, there's deliverance. You don't have to live that way. God can deliver you from that. He can fill you with His Holy Spirit to give you strength to overcome those temptations. But I really liked him saying that. So anyway, Psalms 90 and 17. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. That should be your prayer every day. God, may your favor rest on me today. That's probably the best way to put it. I get the 2018 thing. Chase me down. Because I like, you know, I like to make it exciting. But that's precious. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Proverbs 3, 1 through 4 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Right there he says he'll give you favor with him and he'll give you favor with man. Why did Ruth have favor with God and with man? Because she sacrificed the gods that she served. She sacrificed her family that she could have stayed with. And she went to live to her in a foreign land with a lady that was a mother, a mother-in-law. How many people would choose their mother-in-law over their mama? 
That's a testimony. That's a miracle. Think about that, though, how much you love your mother. I love my mother-in-law, but my mama's my mama. (laughs) That would have to be a God thing. That's precious. She sacrificed for that. You know, I I want you to understand something, that your righteousness doesn't earn your salvation, but your righteousness will get you favor. We can't earn salvation. Salvation is free. Jesus offered that. He went to the cross for that. He took stripes for that. He bled for that. But we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about favor. Your favor comes from your obedience. Your favor comes from righteousness. Your favor comes from walking blameless. The Bible says to be holy as I am holy, God says. He knows we can't be perfect. We can't take that title. Perfection is Jesus. Perfection is God. We can't do that. But we can strive every day to be holy. We can strive every day to obey the Lord, to listen to Him, to read His Word, to pray and ask Him to show us things. It's amazing when we, when we get a relationship with the Lord how things really change. We see things completely different through different glasses through a whole different vision. And all of a sudden, things begin to be clear. And the more we serve Him, the more we want it. Who would not want favor that brings blessings, protection, and peace? So to me, if we love God, then we want to follow Him. We should. We want to obey Him. We should. We want to trust Him. We should. And we're willing to sacrifice. We're willing to sacrifice all that stuff that we don't need. All that stuff that brings us down. All those people that take us away from our relationship with Him. Sometimes we have to sacrifice people. If Ruth would have gone back to her family, she would have fallen right back into worshiping those foreign gods. I believe she thought that. And she wasn't willing to do that. She would rather have God than the foreign God. She was willing to sacrifice all that she knew, all that she had grown up to be, to follow the Lord. And with that came favor. And if you'll read on, I want to read Numbers 6, 24 and 26 as well real quick. This is a a prayer that I'm going to pray over you, and we're going to pray it together here in a few minutes. But if you'll read on into the book of Ruth, you'll find out that her and Boaz actually got married. And when they got married, this is just how God works. After they get married, this is the family. This is the family line. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amenadab. Amenadab, the father of Nashalon. Nashalon, the father of uh, Saman. Saman, father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. So Boaz and Ruth had a son, and his name was Obed. Obed had a son, and his name was Jesse. Jesse had a son, and it was King David. Isn't it funny how God puts things together? when we let him work and we live in his favor. And then Ruth had a name for herself. God wants to give you a name tonight. He wants to put his favor on you tonight. He wants to bless you tonight. If you'll stand on your feet, we're going to pray. I want the praise team to come and I want you to play that song again but before they do I love this I love this um, prayer and actually we were talking about this the other day a lot of pastors pray this over their congregation at the end of every service and it's just an amazing prayer and it says the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you how many want God's face to shine on you I do at the end of the day I want God to smile at me 
I want God to smile knowing that, you know what, I wasn't perfect that day, but I really did try to please Him. May the Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. That's His favor. So as we pray that, we're praying favor over ourselves. Let's go to 24 again. May the Lord bless me and keep me. May the Lord make His face shine on me and be gracious to me. May the Lord turn His face toward me and give me peace. You need to write that down. You need to put your name right in there. Is that selfish? Absolutely not. You're His favorite, remember? I think God desires for His people to pray that way. I think God wants His people to pray for His favor so He can show them what He can do. Heavenly Father, we come to You tonight, Lord, and we thank You, God, for favor. We thank You, Lord God, that You sent Your Son, Jesus, to die on a cross for us. Even though we weren't worthy in the natural, God, You made us worthy. Lord, even though there's been billions of people in the world, if I was the only person, you would have done it for me. God, thank you for your favor. We know that favor, Lord Jesus, doesn't come by itself. It comes with a price. Obedience. Righteousness. Blamelessness. We are standing here in a room tonight, God, with a group of people that I know want your favor. They want your face to shine on them. Even though they're not perfect and they've made mistakes, tonight's a new night. It's a different time. It's a different day. So God, if there be someone here that hasn't called on you to be their Savior, I'm praying they'll do so now. And they'll say something like, Lord Jesus, come in my heart. Change my life. Make me new. And God, when you do that, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to be the best Christian that I can be. Following you. Obeying you, Lord. Not with perfection. But knowing that when I stumble... Your grace is there to pick me up. Your grace is there to dust me off. Your grace is there to point me in the right direction that I can keep on moving forward. If you're here tonight and you want God's favor to shine on you, I want you to raise your hand. Everybody in this room needs to be raising their hand. I don't know anybody who shouldn't want protection and peace and provision supernatural that's my God he's supernatural how do people come out of, of gang beatings and get run over by not just one car but three cars supernatural God shown his face in a dark place because he has a purpose and he has a plan and everybody in here has a testimony that might not be the same, but it's just as important. And it's just as powerful. You might not have been left for dead and you might not have been brought back with CPR because you, you had no pulse and you weren't breathing. But your testimony is just as great. And it's just as important to God. Your life is important tonight. It deserves His favor. It deserves His blessing. It deserves His face to shine on you. And as we, as we sing this song, if you need prayer, I want you to come to the front. If you want to just come to... because we're, we're not going to pray for anybody individually. We're just going to let you come and pray. Because you may just be coming down saying, you know what, I'm taking a step of faith because I want that favor. I want God's face to shine on me. And with all of that, you're going to have healing. 
We're going to pray collectively. So if you want to come and pray, you're welcome to pray.